I'm um, speaking to you from the Medical Research Building at Royal Perth, where I where I work. Um, so it's great to be here today. A bit cold outside. You might see me glance down at my watch occasionally. I'll try to make sure that I don't go over time. So I'll uh, try to uh, move along carefully each time. Um, I'll start by acknowledging country, and and I'd like to acknowledge that I, that I'm uh, on uh, Wajak Noongar land and the lands of the Noongar people and um, it's great to be on Noongar Buja and um, I'd like to acknowledge the Wajak people as the traditional custodians and pay my respects to elders past and present and you can see the beautiful artwork done by my PhD student Margaret Kitchup who's the Wajak Noongar woman and uh, uh, as we walk on the journey together um, I'd like to also thank any Aboriginal people who might be listening to this presentation right now or who may turn it on to listen to later. Thanks for coming. I'm going to talk just a little bit about the etiology of falls events, just a little, to set the scene for talking about the evidence of a later systematic review that we've recently published. And in that review, there's um, a focus on patient education, multifactorial interventions and assistive devices. And I'm going to finish by talking a bit about the role of education uh, for patients so that we um, hopefully can get a picture of what's really possibly the most effective thing to do in hospitals. And so I'll just um, start by saying that most of the work in this talk has been done either funded by my investigator grant or also has been funded by a partnership grant which myself and Meg Morris have been running over the past four years throughout Australia in Health Scope Hospitals and Northern Health partially in Victoria. And so a lot of the new findings and work uh, we have um, are from funding from there. And I'd just like you to put into your mind, the back of your mind right now, you know, why is patient education an important component of what we do? So just keep that in mind as we work our way through. It doesn't hurt us to um, revise some of the costs of falls and the cost of trying to prevent falls has been recently estimated to be about $46 million. When you look at all the things that people are trying to do to prevent falls. So that was the cost for six health services. Um, so a very good colleague of mine, Terry Haynes, a real falls expert, uh, took six health services and they looked carefully at all the things they were doing to prevent falls and then went through carefully and costed them all. So if you extrapolate that nationally to all health services in Australia, you come up with the figure that we're probably spending about $590 million a year trying to prevent falls. Now, that tells us what an important area it is and, and why it is something that we really need to focus on. Because every time a single person falls in hospital, then there's a consequence for them and their recovery and their um, ability to move on from whatever reason caused them to come to hospital. So if we're spending $590 million a year, it would be good if we could work on spending it, well, spending less of it or spending it most effectively, wouldn't it, and really reducing falls. So the first thing I'd like you to consider when you think about the etiology of falls, I think that um, for many for many people, um, particularly I think some of our newer, younger graduates, you know, when they're coming into a hospital setting, um, it can be easy to think that falls are about the patient. You know, aren't falls just about the patient? And if the patient have wonderful balance, like my grandson you see there who can uh, tippy-toe nicely over long pieces of rope like he's doing there, you know, if the patient had excellent balance, wouldn't it mean there'd be no falls? Now, we've done some big work uh, with US Falls databases, and in the US, we used a injurious Falls database, and we looked at all a, a group of patients that had injurious Falls, so not non-injurious um, and only people that had injurious Falls. Now, of those, when we started to examine their Falls, 55% have been classified as at high risk of falling. 
but 45% of those who had an injurious fall had in their notes that they weren't at much risk of falling. So the pre whatever risk scores and whatever risk assessment they'd had, it hadn't accurately reflected the risk they had on admission, wasn't reflected in the fact that they had a fall. So, you know, patient risk is, is not really always something that's really good to look at. And when you think about it, one of the things that's important to realise is that when you look at a fall in hospital, yes, it's about um, the patient. <laughs> that's true. But oh, here we go. Oh, I think somebody's OK. Everyone voice there. Can someone get in? Yep, good. It is about the patient, but remember, it's also about the environment. The patient is now in a new environment. Things are in a different place. Equipment's different. Their bed's different. And it's also about the staff because it's the staff helping patients, staff actions on the wards. Those are all things that contribute to hospital falls. And so it's not just about the patient. And so risk is a moving target. Patient risk fluctuates and alters fairly regularly. And it's due to the differing nature of those three elements at any one point in time. So if we're going to reduce falls, then we're obviously going to need to look at how can we look at that risk in a more holistic way? How can we reduce falls? So sometimes thinking that we've assessed the patient and ticked off what we think are risks and moved on those is going to leave us sort of having a limited view. We, we want to try to take a broader view. One of the things that we did recently, which we've published in the Journal of the American Geriatric Society, is we took um, a large number of hospitals, health scope hospitals, and we gave half of them a risk decision tool where they looked at the patient carefully and assessed what sort of help the patient would need and what things the patient needed. And then the other half continued on with the normal risk assessment, um, which involved, you know, ticking against boxes as to what the patient needed. And what we found was that when you looked at those two elements, using um, the decision support tool, so not a risk type of assessment, not, not producing a high or a low or a medium risk, produced as good a result, it didn't make any difference to um, falls on hospitals. So suggesting that the risk, you know, because with the nurses on these wards, obviously they would feel anxious to think, well, can we disinvest from that risk score? You know, don't we need to be sure that we, we're rating people somehow? And the answer to that is, well, not really, because your, it's it's really your clinical tailored decision making for any one patient that helps you prevent them from falling, not a really standard approach to every patient. Another thing that's really important to think about when you think about the etiology of falls is how early falls happen. And we sort of have a feeling about this, but again, this is a big data set that um, my research fellow Jackie Francis Code um, worked on and we analysed uh, these falls in the United States again. And once again, in acute, these are acute medical and surgical wards. And we found that people fall very early in their stay. So what you can see is that by day five, nearly everyone who's going to have a fall has had it. So this again suggests that risk alters according to the stay in hospital and one of the key times to look at risk is very early on and what is happening at that time. That's something that we should be thinking about too. Let's have a look at something else which is really fundamental as well. And again, we've got large studies in the US done by my colleague Ron Shaw with Vincent Stagg and we've got um, recent studies that I did with US database and our own study here in WA that I did and all these studies are very consistent. And you can see the WA data. They show that 75 in our study in WA, 86% of falls happen when people are unobserved. So this is a really powerful finding, isn't it? Because it shows that 
the fall happens when patients are doing something that they've initiated. It isn't the nurse there with them, helping them, and then they fall to the ground. They've done something themselves. They've thought something, they've behaved in a certain way, but for whatever reason, they're unobserved. So I think these are things that give us clues about what falls are like in hospital. So having thought about that, you know, what, what, how do falls happen and what kind of things should we be thinking about when we think about falls? I want to bring you to our latest systematic review, which is um, just been published in the Journal of Age and Aging. So it was published at the end of um, May, uh, end of May. So it was out in press a couple of weeks ago, and it's just out. And I'm very excited. You can't often tell people I'm telling you something that we literally have just finished and published, but that's uh, so for this. So we did a systematic review and meta analysis. Um, of hospital fall interventions. And we included 43 studies and there was quite a lot of heterogeneity in the studies. So we had a wide range of interventions and study designs. The only intervention that significantly reduced falls in the meta-analysis was education. It was the only intervention. It reduced falls rates and it reduced the risk of falling. So it reduced the number of people who fall, fell as well as the rate of falls. Multifactorial trials where people use a lot of interventions all at once and measure a group type, grouped type of intervention showed some positive impact, not significant, but a tendency to positiveness. And sensors and alerts in when you pulled numbers of trials showed no effect. And what I'll do is I go into that now. With the education, um, I know both these trials really well. And one of the things that for me is so important is that both these trials were conducted. One of them was conducted in two states, the trial by Haynes et al, WA and Queensland. And the study that was led by myself with help from a lot of good people here in WA was conducted solely in WA. So it really is our own findings, which I think sometimes if studies are done, say, in the United States, we might think, well, that could be a little bit different to us. These are studies done by us. And when we pull the results of both Haynes and Hills, there's a significant effect for patient education. In both these trials, the patient has received education. In the second trial done by myself in 2015, there's been some backup education of staff about the patient education. So in the first trial, we gave the patients education, but the staff didn't have any idea of really what we said to the patients or did anything, as you do with a randomized trial of an intervention. In the second uh, iteration of this trial, when we did it in 2015, we gave the patients the education, but we told staff what we were telling the patients. So the patients received education and staff got told, this is what we've told patients, this is the type of education that's been given. And um, staff knew what the patients had been told so they could back it up. You can see that there is that strongly significant effect. When you look at assistive devices, these are studies that have looked at bed alarms and sensors and uh, low, low beds, and they show that there is no significant effect when you look at falls rates or the risk of falls. And there's now in the study on falls rates, there's four large studies or three large studies and one smaller study there. And when you pull those, they don't show any effect and the same with false risk. And when you look at multifactorial interventions, and these are ones where there's a group of interventions and they're all a little bit different, but if you group those trials, you can see that it looks like there is some evidence of effect there. So when you look at that diamond at the bottom, you can see it's just tipping over into the intervention side of efficacy. Now, let's just unpack that a little bit. Multifactorial interventions that showed more effect generally included combinations of those sorts of interventions. So the multifactorial trials that seemed to show some effect 
used patient or staff education and they also used things that relate to education like call buttons and responses and regular toileting and managing of cognitive impairment because as I'll talk about later patient education reminds patients to ring the bell that's one of its strongest tenets, patient education. If you tell patients to ring the bell and simultaneously staff are doing rounding or staff are, are using techniques to make sure they respond to bells very fast, you can see how that would have a very good effect. So that's some of the some of the things that have helped in multifactorial interventions. So things that haven't helped are providing patients with a risk assessment and using a low, low bed. You know, those aren't interventions in multifactorial interventions that have been very effective. What I'd like to do is just talk to you about a couple of studies that are in the meta-analysis and tend to show why this meta-analysis is probably very strong in its results. There's been a very recent trial looking at sensor um, sensor devices and these are wearable sensors and one of the arms of the trial was in WA so again our local data. In this um, RCT there were three wards and patients wore sensor vests to alert staff to movement. Now this obviously played into the can we can we respond to patients well but in that sense if we if we have a sensor going off that'll give us some earlier warning that patients are getting up rather than um, a floor alarm which might tell us till the patient's already up. In this trial, which is a well conducted trial, there was no significant difference in false outcomes. So again, you know, really strongly concurring with what the meta analysis is showing. When you have a look at um, a scoping review we've done, which has been really well cited, done by our PhD student Hazel Heng. When we looked at um, 43 studies, and not our not our own studies, 24 in the USA, for example. So many studies: uh, uh, Singapore, Malaysia. 11 studies use patient education as a single intervention, and the remainder of the 43 used patient education as one strong arm of the intervention. Those studies all reduced falls. They weren't all RCTs, but they all reduced falls. Some of them showed that the reason they reduced falls was they improved patients' knowledge and self-perception self of falls risk, and they empowered patients to reduce their risk of falling. And the sorts of trials that these trials did that were effective, the sorts of interventions, I should say, were direct patient education, so actually telling patients about falls and helping them understand what to do, providing consumer materials for patients and families and going through it with them, and policies that included patient education. So actually the organisation is saying, you know, our policy is that every patient who comes in will get their education. And so those were seen to be effective, again, concurring with our systematic review. And finally, I like to talk to you just again in a concurring sense about some international hospital research. If you look in the United States, there's one researcher who has made some successful inroads and that is Patricia Dykes, who's a very senior nurse researcher. And they and they have had two of one, two of the only trials, one an RCT and one a step wedge non-RCT. They have reduced falls rates and they have reduced falls rates using an intervention they've been developing now over some years. And you can find this online fairly easily. Their fall prevention toolkit called Falls Tips. In this Falls Tips, they work with the patient and family to educate them about falls. And they produce a very tailored, um, specific Falls Tip uh, brochure or handout for that patient. And so it either goes in an e-copy by the patients if they've got an electronic monitoring system by their bed, the patient can see it that way, or it can be displayed as a poster for the patient. But either way, it's very personalised to that patient. Like it might have a picture showing the patient using their frame if they were meant to use a frame. And importantly, each shift that is reviewed by the nurse with the patient and their family. They've had a reduction in falls and injury rates using this 
uh, false tips, which is like um, the patient education that we've delivered in our trials to some extent. It's We've asked people to make a plan, but we haven't displayed it at the bed. We've got our patients to write it in a little workbook. But the idea of displaying it is very important, really, because it gives patient and nurse a clear idea of what it is. And one of the things that they talked about, and this is exactly what we've found in our trials with patient education and exactly what our systematic review found is, when you engage with patients, they will carry out specific tasks that are for preventive related, you know, that are safety related, if they're recommended by healthcare professionals and if they're engaged in that process. So it's, uh, you know, very, again, concurring research. So I'm going to come back to my original comment and say, well, why is patient education important? One of the reasons is that if you don't tell patients about falls, all research shows that they have a diametrically opposite view of falls to any health professional. If you ask any older person why falls happen, they'll tell you that it's an accident. Just who knows why and how, they've got no idea. If you ask any health professional why falls happen, they'll say, well, people have got numbers of risk factors and you know you have to address the risk factors to stop the falls. If you don't tell patients about falls, they will not be thinking they'll fall. And even if they feel like, oh gosh, I feel pretty wobbly, I could fall, they won't realise there's anything they should do about it. And you telling them, please ring the bell for me, won't have the effect on them because they'll be thinking, oh, that's all right though, because I'm not in any risk of fall. So the lady said to ring the bell if I was going to fall, but I wouldn't fall. You know, so that's the, probably the single biggest reason why patient education works. So patients have lots of different thoughts and feelings and their feelings and thoughts are the key reasons they take risks, the key reasons for their behaviour. So unless you dialogue and have education, you won't know what they're thinking. And here's some of the things that when we ask our patients, you know, with all our education trials, you know, we say, well, why did you get up and fall over? Because, you know, the nurse told you that, you know, you should sit down because your legs are wobbly. Oh, well, I thought I could just do it. And, you know, I tend to be overconfident. So even though the nurse said I couldn't, I thought, no, what the heck, I'll give it a go. So, you know, our patients have very different views to us. And this was one of the things about our recovery, safe recovery education, and we still find this anywhere that's doing it. Patients will say, wow, this, this has really helped me. I'm really understanding this now. You know, I'm getting it. It's really encouraged me to prevent myself from falling. You know, gee, it's, I didn't realise I have to be more safe here. You know, so that's the whole idea of education. It it makes your patients feel positively about following the rehabilitation pathway that you're trying to set out. So instead of you going out of the room and them just thinking, oh, I'll nip to the toilet without my frame, I'll give it a go. They'll be thinking, oh, now hang on, I'm, I'm meant to be using my frame. That's how I'm going to be getting better gradually. You know, so that it's that kind of important task. We recently rejigged and retried um, some focus group interviews with people, and this is our, our student Hazel Heng in HealthScope. And we interviewed 33 patients who had had no education. And again, we found exactly the same things we found in our earlier trials and what they found in the US too. The patients didn't realize they were at any risk of falling in hospital. So even a couple of years later, when people say to me, well, Anne-Marie, we're giving out brochures now, you know, if you don't really talk with patients, they won't realise. And most patients thought that falls weren't relevant to them. And patients did feel, though, that they'd be willing to listen to some education and they'd like to have some groups if it were able to be done. You know, so that was patients' perspectives. And this is some of the quotes from these patients. And these are the quotes exactly what we find before people have education. I think someone's sicker than me, so I can probably do it myself. You know, the nurse is busy. She'll need to go to the bed of that sick person, so I'll just get up myself. You know, this is a very common theme among patients. And so if you compare the two sorts of patients, one who haven't had education in our study in Melbourne, last year, where they're saying, you know, I really would like some direction on this. You know, I, I don't feel I do know anything about fall prevention. And if you compare that with what our patients have said who've had the education, 
they've said the exact opposite. Gee, now I've had this education, it makes me feel more confident to talk to the physio about what I can and can't do. Whereas patients that haven't are just sitting there thinking, gee, I'd like, oh, I sort of maybe I should ask someone. No, no, I better not. I might get in trouble. So you can see that kind of theme coming across there of why it's so important. And I just want to alert you a little bit to um, why I believe that we still need to be working hard as a staff group to A, educate our patients and B, think about our perspective, particularly with our new staff and casual staff ourselves. This is an interesting study, which another research fellow of mine, Lex De Jong did, of um, our data here in WA. So it's part of a follow-up of a large trial that I led. And we looked at 500 falls incident reports from different hospitals. And we looked at what people said, what, what, what was reported about the fall. You know, what did people say? Obviously, some things are reported automatically, the time of the fall, the day of the fall, the age of the patient. What we did was examine carefully the text. What had the person who reported the fall written? It was really interesting that less than 50% reported any patient feedback about the fall. So it didn't appear. Now, they may have asked them, but not put it in the text. So, you know, we have to be careful there. It could be that they asked them. But in the text reports, there's less than 50% mentioned that they've asked the patient, well, what, what was happening? Why, why do you think you fell? You know, what were your thoughts and feelings? Why did you get up? And 87% of people did not report the bell status. Now, this is a really key thing because if the patient got up and didn't ring the bell, there's a really clear instruction you can now give them. You can have that discussion with them about the bell. Okay, next time it'd be great if you ring the bell, but what will happen before that that you want to have the discussion about is, why didn't you ring the bell? Because that's the real hub of the question. That's where patient education works. Most patients don't ring the bell because they're too frightened or scared or worried that they're not sick enough and they shouldn't be bothering people. So it's very important to say, why didn't you ring the bell? Could you, could you let me know? And then the patient can say, well, um, I, I, I just sort of felt like maybe I should do it myself. And that gives you the chance to say, oh, no, hang on a minute. It's no trouble and we'd much prefer you ring the bell. Uh, we really are here to help you. And please ring the bell at any time. Uh, if we don't come and you feel you have to press it again, please do that. We really want to be here to help you. So it's very important. And you can see the, the four studies there where they said they pressed the bell and didn't wait. Those four people, that's good information because you can now give a more specific instruction. You can say, look, I know it's difficult to wait. I'm very sorry there seemed to be that delay. We will come as quickly as we can and please wait next time. But thank you for ringing. Please wait next time. So it's really interesting that we need to think of it from that perspective. Now, you may be wondering, if we're going to be giving patients education, surely that could cut across what we're doing and you know may not sort of fit in with the way we're, we're running the ward. We've, we've done several focus groups after the safe recovery education and again, all our WA nurses, and we found overwhelmingly that nurses thought that falls education for patient promoted a very positive culture around fall prevention. Most of our nurses made very glowing comments about it was wonderful when I went in the room and I found the patient sitting there waiting for me instead of them just getting up. Or I found the patient said to me, oh, excuse me, I need to get my shoes. Or the patient said, oh, can you leave my bell for me? So that was marvellous. They also found that it was great to have an educator around because that was somebody that they could think, great, they're an expert and they're going around. I can be sure the patients are getting that education. And finally, many staff commented to us that it changed their behaviour and communication and clinical practice because once they had a few patients who'd had education say, oh, excuse me, could you leave my bell in reach? I want to be sure to ring it. I've been told I have to get some help. 
then, of course, when they went to see other patients, including those with cognitive impairment, they thought, oh, you know, I must leave the bell in reach. And so that's why we found it had a very good effect for people with cognitive impairment as well, because some of the safety strategies that nurses began to take on and allied health began to take on tended to flow over automatically nicely into the people with cognitive impairment as well. So I'm just going to finish by saying um, really the, the latest systematic review shows that patient education with um, staff backup is a really important um, a really important and key plank of how we're going to reduce falls and also promote really good care, which I think is important. And part of that education uses a personalised medicine approach, which is really so important because what we want to do is talk with patients and get a toileting plan and patient goals going. And that allows us to also see if our patient is delirious or, or confused. And it helps us to set up a plan with the patient and goals that are going to keep that patient safe, but also provide them with good care. If we ask our patient, for example, well, let me, um, you know, part of the goal is we'll, we'll need to assist you to go to the toilet, you know, do you, and the patient's sort of saying, well, oh, but you know, I need to go very frequently. That gives us a chance to, to dialogue with them and really give them a personalized toilet plan that's have that dialogue about how their toileting is going, how their continence is. Make sure that we're setting it up so that the patient can succeed. I think that I'll just finish there, but I will point out that one of the key things about education is that anytime you do education, you're tending to start uh, the way we start in standard and we're doing at the moment with the health scope intervention we're just about to roll out across um, some 6,000 patients is that we start by talking with the patient and doing a little screen. So that allows a nurse to instantly tell if a patient's got a cognitive impairment. That's one of the most helpful things really about patient education too is it automatically as soon as you see a little button above a bed that shows a person's had education, you think well that person's probably reasonably with it. If you don't see a button, you think this is a person that's got cognitive impairment and I'll need to work differently with them. I'll need to be careful that they're not becoming delirious, for example. I'll need to be careful to provide supportive environment because I can't expect them to remember. So that understanding who doesn't and who does have cognitive impairment is really important. And I'm just going to finish by saying um, for those of you who um, have been around in the story of the Safe Recovery Program, we've just done a new Safe Recovery video and book and we're about, uh, we've been pilot testing it in a hospital in Perth and we're about to uh, try rolling it out again, uh, you know, with some, some modern resources for people. So um, very happy to talk with anybody about that. And um, of course, this research is done by an enormous expert team, including international